All right, so um, thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. Um, so today I'll tell you about this idea I've been thinking about for the last year and a half or so, for what the, um, the RT entropy might be counting from the bulk point of view. Um, I think for many people in this audience, you, you heard some earlier version of this talk before, so for those of you, I'll try to give us a, a status update. So, so the first half of this talk will, um, will be the same as before, but the second half will be new. Um, but I'll start from the top for those of you who haven't. Okay, so, so let me start with the motivation. Um, so, so a question that, that we would all like to know the answer to is um, what black hole entropy is counting from a um, canonical Lorentzian gravity point of view. Um, we believe that there should be some answer, um, some, some universal explanation for this area without having to go to a full microscopic theory since we can derive the area term in the Euclidean gravity argument, but there it's not clear what it is that we're counting. Um, so for this talk today, I'll replace the black hole entropy with its um, cousin in ADS-CFT, the RT formula, and um, my goal will be to suggest an interpretation for it. Um, so as, as we've heard several times this week, right, the, the RT formula says that in ADS-CFT, if you have some state with a um, with an, uh, with an Einstein gravity dual, then the um, entanglement across a region on the boundary is, um, is given by the, the area of the minimal area homologous uh, surface in the bulk divided by 4G Newton plus uh, subleading corrections, um, the first of which is the um, algebraic entanglement entropy of bulk gauge invariant operators in the region contained between uh, B and its RT surface. Um, and the, the idea that I noticed last year was that this formula looks similar to a formula that you can write down for the entanglement entropy of a region in an emergent gauge theory. Um, so let me suppose that the emergent gauge theory has a explicit UV regulator since we want to compare it to gravity, which is UV finite. Um, it's convenient, though not necessary, as we'll see, to make this regulator be a lattice regulator. Um, so making this assumption now for convenience, um, suppose we have the following situation. Suppose that we have in the UV a Hilbert space, um, which is a tensor product of microscopic Hilbert spaces at sites or links of a lattice. Um, and suppose we choose a Hamiltonian for it so that in a low energy subspace of the states, the states are in one-to-one -one correspondence with um, states of the gauge theory on the lattice. Um, then I claim that a formula like the second line here is true that the, um, the UV entanglement entropy can be written in a more IR way as the algebraic entanglement entropy of um, gauge invariant operators in the region, um, plus a term called an edge term that basically counts the UV correlations of um, stuff at the entangling surface due to the emergent gauge constraint. Um, so, so at this stage, I haven't defined any of these things for you, and I'll do that over the course of the talk. Um, the, I guess the, the the, the sort of the, the main point will be that if you um, if you sort of naively um, compare these two equations, then the area term looks a bit like this um, like this edge term in the second scenario below. So developing this analogy will be um, one of the goals of my talk. Okay. Um, so here's the plan. So I give you the motivation. Um, I'll spend basically half the talk trying to explain these things better. Um, I'll review for you the situation. Um, with entanglement entropy in gauge theories, um, as well as the RT formula. And then I'll come back to this equation on the first slide. Um, I'll also briefly um, summarize several related results from earlier in the literature. Um, and then the second part, which um, I th will hopefully be new for those of you who heard me give the first part before, um, I'll describe the um, progress so far in my efforts to make this conjecture more precise in low dimensional theories. Okay, so, so, so let me um, get started by reviewing the problem of how you define entanglement entropy in a gauge theory. Um, so this is really the summary of the work of uh, many people in the last five or so years, including some of the people in this audience. Um, okay, so, so what's, what's the problem with defining entanglement entropy in a gauge theory? Uh, well, on the, at the top of this slide here, I have this, the usual prescription that, that we usually have in mind right, when we compute an entanglement entropy. We assume we have a Hilbert space um, that factorizes into the tensor product of two, of two um, subsystems, which allows us to um, compute a reduced density matrix by taking a partial trace, and then the entanglement entropy is the von Neumann entropy of that reduced density matrix. Um, unfortunately, this is never really true in a QFT. 
Um, right, I guess one way to say it is that if you look at um, small distance, uh, sufficiently small distances, all states of QFTs have the same um, universal behavior, right? The, um, the modular Hamiltonian asymptotes to the Rindler Hamiltonian, um, and that's inconsistent with factorization. Um, so, so one thing that we often have in the back of our heads is that we can take our QFT and, um, and put it on a lattice. And then if the degrees of freedom in your QFT are local operators, like for scalar field theory, um, we can then go ahead and use this recipe at the top of the slide. Um, so this was how people originally compute the entanglement entropy in scalar field theories in the 90s, but of course this isn't enough to bias factorization um, for a gauge theory. Um, the reason being that in that case we have um, Hamiltonian constraints that relate the space-like separated data. So in the bottom part of this slide here, I'm just um, quickly reviewing the Hilbert space of a lattice gauge theory. Um, so the basic degrees of freedom in lattice gauge theory are going to be um, group elements living on the links of the lattice. Um, this is like the integral of the gauge field over a finite distance. Um, and the the entire Hilbert space will be the tensor product of those Hilbert spaces on the links, but subject to um, Gauss's law, which says that the uh, flux entering any site of the link um, has to be zero. And the way we impose that in equations is that we demand that the, um, that the action of this Gauss operator on, the states, on, on states that we allow in our physical Hilbert space is um, trivial where a Gauss operator at a site of the lattice is like the product of all the, of the uh, momentum operators at the immediately adjoining um, links of the lattice that increment those um, group elements by the same amount. Um, so it's this, uh, it's this Gauss constraint that prevents our Hilbert space from factorizing. Um, so suppose we, um, we nonetheless want to define a notion of a reduced density matrix for some region on the links. Um, so what are some reasonable things that we might do? Um, so I think there basically have been two um, sort of orth um, independent, orthogonally presented um, prescriptions in the literature. Um, so the first is, um, is this algebraic definition. It's actually a much more general framework that allows you to assign an entanglement entropy to any subalgebra in your theory. Um, the, the basic idea is that if you have um, some state in the Hilbert space of a finite dimensional system and you have some subalgebra um, of your operator algebra, in general, you will be able to pick a unique um, element of your subalgebra um, such that it reproduces the expectation values of everything else in your subalgebra when you use it as the density operator. Um, so this lets us. So, so then if we take that to be the um, density matrix for A0, then we can define entanglement entropy for any subalgebra. Now for a subset of lattice links, um, an, an especially natural choice is to take the um, entanglement entropy of, that, of the subregion to be this algebraic entanglement entropy for the maximal um, gauge invariant subalgebra supported on those links. Um, so these guys call this the electric center choice. Um, you can also ask what happens if you consider non-maximal gauge invariant subalgebras on the links, but I'll just talk about the maximal one today. Okay. Um, a, a second definition that was suggested by, by these groups and, um, is that at the level of the, um, at the, level of the Hilbert space, um, we can, we can um, if we want to define the entanglement entropy for a subregion, we can embed the Hilbert space in sort of the minimal larger Hilbert space that factorizes across that region, um, basically by defining an extended Hilbert space to be the lattice Hilbert space where we don't impose Gauss's law at any of the links along the boundary of the region. Um, then, so, so this, is a, this is a unique and completely well-defined thing you can do for any region of the lattice. And then, um, you can take any state in your physical Hilbert space embedded in the extended Hilbert space with, um, with zero support on the orthogonal complement and compute a reduced density matrix by taking a partial trace in the larger Hilbert space. Okay. Um, so just as a side comment, this the second definition you can also fit in the framework of the, in, the, in this more general algebraic framework as well. If you sort of consider it to be the algebraic entanglement entropy of an extended operator algebra that also includes um, like Wilson line operators that end on the boundary of your region. Um, so for the next couple slides, um, let me focus on the second definition. Um, it might seem a bit ad hoc at this stage, but it's, the, it's, it's like the, a, a relevant idea when you consider an emergent gauge theory. Um, okay, so let me start by doing uh, my favorite example. Um, 
so we can look at the simplest possible example of a lattice, which is just um, two links and, and two sites. Um, so this is also known as the problem of computing entanglement entropy across an interval um, for uh, yang mills theory on, on an S1, uh, which was worked out in a nice paper by Donnelly. Um, so, so 2D yang mills is a completely solved theory. Um, so we, we know everything about it. Um, the, 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 Hilbert's, the physical Hilbert space of this theory um, you can show is the space of class functions on the group manifold. Um, a convenient basis for which is provided by the um, characters of the group in various representations. Um, for the extended Hilbert space, we want to lift Gauss's law at all the boundary sites of the region, which in this case are just the, the two endpoints. Um, so the extended Hilbert space is the tensor product of the Hilbert space on the two links, um, where the Hilbert space on each link is the space of group elements, as I, um, as, as, as I said in the previous slide. A convenient um, basis for a convenient basis um, for for the on the group manifold is provided by um, matrix elements of the um, various representations of the group. Um, so, sort of at a at a formal level, then the way you embed the um, physical Hilbert space in the extended Hilbert space is you just um, you just um, apply the definition of the character as the trace over the um, trace over the diagonal group elements twice. Um, so that, that explains how you, how you do this embedding. Um, at, a, at, at a more physical level, what we're sort of doing is, um, when we go from the physical to the extended Hilbert space, is insisting that we can cut all the Wilson loop operators around the circle at the two endpoints by adding, um, by adding um, infinitely massive surface charges in every representation of the gauge group. Um, these surface charges are, not, are, are gauge variant, so to, to, to demand that we get a gauge invariant state, um, we have them transform oppositely, um, which is why we identify the indices. Um, okay, so once we, once we have this embedding, we can take the most general state of our physical Hilbert space and compute the entanglement entropy in this prescription. Um, so I just, I just wrote down the answer here. If you do this computation, you see that it's the sum of two terms. Um, the first is a Shannon entropy for the probability distribution over this basis. Um, and the second term, which um, only shows up in non-abelian gauge theories and will sort of be the hero of the story, is this um, term that measures like the dimension of the representation, so sort of the entanglement between these um, surface charges that we added to the ends of the intervals. Um, Okay, so a quick, a quick comment is that this, this was a two-dimensional example. If you wanted to go to a lattice gauge theory in, in higher than two dimensions, then you let this R label all the possible um, like super selection sectors through the boundary states instead of just the representations, and you'll find the same types of edge terms from every link along the boundary of the lattice. Okay. Um, so let me make a few comments about this extended Hilbert space definition. Um, the, f the first comment is that um, I, I gave you the definition on the lattice, um, but we, could also, we can also do this in the continuum if we like. Um, so in the continuum, the thing that we would do is um, quantize the configuration space of our continuum gauge theory, um, but without, without fixing the time-independent gauge symmetries along the boundary of the entangling region. Um, so actually, this was how people um, quantized um, Chern-Simons theories on manifolds with boundaries for independent reasons in the 80s. And if you, um, if you take that Hilbert space to be your extended Hilbert space in this construction that I described, you can, um, you can derive the topological entanglement entropy in a continuum Chern Simons theory using this approach. Um, so this is worked out in these papers. I won't talk more about this here. Um, the, the point is just that this isn't special to the lattice regulator. Um, a second comment, which is sort of just a, a, a technical footnote that I'll use later on in the talk, is that if you have a, um, if you have a TQFT and you compute the, um, the entanglement entropy using like the naive replica trick from gluing subregions without, um, without put, like, changing the topology by cutting out some region around the conical singularity, um, then the answer you get agrees with the extended Hilbert space answer. Or in other words, the um, extended Hilbert space corresponds to the replica trick boundary conditions that are contractible to a point. Um, okay, and then a, th a third comment um, is that we can compare this approach to the, to the algebraic definition um, that I showed you a few slides ago. 
And this extended hyperspace definition agrees, um, it differs from the algebraic definition of the electric center choice um, by the log dr term. So it includes the Shannon term, but not the log dr term. Um, so I think this was first pointed out by, by these people. Um, but on, a, on, a sort of, on an intuitive level, it's, it's, it's kind of clear that um, this, this log dr term is counting the correlations of these um, extra non-gauge invariant line operators that we added to our theory when we extended the Hilbert space. Um, so we wouldn't expect a definition that was just intrinsic to gauge invariant operators to necessarily capture it. This last, um, the, the, the edge term? It, it, it does depend on the state. Yeah, yeah, it's in, in the state labeled by R, it's, still, it's uh, the, the dimension of the representation. Right. Okay. okay um, so, so two more comments that are important. Um, so the first is this um, connection to emergent gauge theories that I mentioned earlier. Um, Right, so far this extended Hilbert space is like a totally formal construction that we put in to demand that our theory factorizes. Um, but if we replace this Hilbert space with uh, the UV Hilbert space in a gauge theory that emerges from a factorizable theory in the sense that I described earlier, um, then that form this formula with this edge term will hold up to a state independent constant. Um, so, so one example where you should be able to convince yourself that this is true is if you consider the case where your UV Hilbert space is like the Hilbert space of lattice gauge theory where you don't impose any of the Gauss constraints at sites and you impose the constraints um, dynamically by adding a term in the Hamiltonian, so like in the torque code, for example. Um, in, in a more general theory, this is, um, your UV degrees of freedom will look very different, but this is still true basically because your Wilson loops um, factorize by assumption. Okay. Um, and the last comment is that um, this, this extended Hober space prescription looks kind of um, looks kind of gauge variant, right? You're putting in all these um, all these line operators, so you might you might wonder whether um, you might worry whether it's gauge invariant. You might wonder if there's some way to sort of describe it that's intrinsic to the gauge theory um, without extending the Hilbert space. And the answer is yes. Uh, there always there exists a gauge invariant operator such that when you take its expectation value in the state R in the physical Hilbert space, it gives back this log dr edge term. Um, so you can always write something like this down. So it also means that this prescription is gauge invariant. Um, but this operator, this operator is going to be some, um, some complicated function of the Casimirs of your group. Um, so if someone just handed you the operator, it's not clear that it's counting anything. Um, once you go to the extended Hilbert space, it becomes totally clear that you're counting, you're, you're sort of counting these, these pure gauge degrees of freedom with a very specific measure. Okay, okay so, so that's, that's this formula from the beginning of the talk. Now, um, now what has to happen for us to, to sort of naively apply it to ADS-CFT just a, as a first pass? Um, one, one problem with, with applying it to ADS-CFT is that um, Right, is that there, your two theories live on different space times. So I have to tell you how you relate subregions. Um, but of course, this is, this is known as people have explained this week. Um, subregions in ADS-CFT are related by entanglement wedge reconstruction. Right, namely, um, if, you namely, if you have a region of your boundary uh, CFT, then you draw the RT surface for it, and then the domain of dependence of the region enclosed by um, A and its RT surface is the entanglement wedge. And it's been proved that any um, local bulk operator in your entanglement wedge can be reconstructed as a, um, as a CFT operator on region A. Um, in fact, what you need in order to prove it is, um, is exactly the RT formula and its first subleading correction. Um, so this was uh, shown two years ago by these guys. And then uh, Dan Harlow proved a more general version for all quantum systems, assuming the finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, where he explicitly um, used the notation that the, that the subleading correction to the RT formula is the algebraic entanglement entropy of the gauge invariant operators, the entanglement wedge. Um, okay, so, so this, this equation here is what he proved. And then if we, um, if we just make the assumption that we can apply this um, emergent gauge theory formula um, to, the, to the left-hand side, right, with sort of this naive picture of that, um, the, the diffeomorphism symmetry emerges from the CFT, um, then we get this identification that, um, that I suggested at the beginning of the talk. 
Okay, so um, so so I've now explained the first slide. Um, of course, at, at this stage, we've we've made several assumptions, right? It's a conjecture, or or I guess, I guess we made we made one assumption, which was which is that we can apply this formula at all. Um, but separately, we have to understand better what it means to have a, a log dr type edge term in a theory of gravity, right? For instance, the dimensions of representations um, of the diffeomorphism group are infinite. Um, so one one constructive definition of this term that you can try to explore is this idea of um, quantizing your theory with and without imposing the gauge symmetry at a boundary. Um, okay, so so I'll get back to this very shortly. Um, let me let me first spend like um, just uh, two or three minutes making um, going over a list of some related results in the literature. Um, so this this one result that I like to mention at this point, though I don't really know what to do with it, um, is the bulk interpretation of this calculation by uh, Lukowitz and Maldacena about the added entanglement entropy when you put a, a, a QQ bar pair at opposite ends of the sphere in um, n equals four super Young mills. Um, so so they they. They just did this as a purely boundary computation. Um, they computed the added entanglement entropy of this QQ bar pair using um, using the CHM trick and localization. And they, they find, and one thing they find is that it comes with a log n, and that's basically just because of the color entanglement. Um, so this is like an edge term from the boundary point of view. Um, but then we can try to interpret this calculation in the bulk in ADS CFT. Um, so so in the bulk, this is like the added entanglement entropy you get from from cutting a bulk string that ends on on this pair um, with an entangling surface. Um, from this point of view, it's a challenge to explain why this should come with a degeneracy of n. This is like a, a, a world sheet edge mode, if you like, um, or a Lorentzian version of um, the Susskind Ulm computation um, from the 90s. Um, and I, I don't know how to give you such an interpretation, but it is interesting to compare the power counting of this mysterious factor of n with um, the analogy that I had on the previous slide. Right, so there I said that the area term is something like a space-time edge mode. It's like the log of some boundary degeneracy in space-time. Um, if, you, if you want to pull this onto a single string, then we can think of it as the degeneracy from um, cutting a single closed string in the bulk with um, using this picture that the, the bulk is like a string gas. So you get rid of a factor of E when you go from um, the space-time to the world sheet. Um, now, 1 over G Newton scales as n squared, um, but your string has two n's, so you get a factor of n from each end of, the, of cutting the closed string. Um, so at a, at a naive counting level, this, um, um, this Lucas Moldesena boundary calculation is, um, is consistent with um, our conjecture. Okay. Um, a couple more, just a quick list of related results from previously suggested interpretations of black hole entropy. So I won't discuss this in any detail, but um, just as a list. Um, well, there's one result that in 3D pure quantum gravity, you can relate black hole entropy to the log of a coefficient of the modular S matrix for a uh, level CFT. So this is like a topological entanglement entropy for the Chern-Simons description of, uh, of the pure quantum gravity. Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, topological entanglement entropy in uh, CS theory can be understood to be like a continuum version of this edge term in the extended Hilbert space construction. Um, also, the idea that the black hole entropy is counting pure gauge degrees of freedom was suggested by, I think, really several, several people in the past 20 years, um, so, but, but never really made precise. I think what, what this ADS-CFT um, analogy buys for us, if it's correct, is that it lets you sort of like, put this idea on a horizonless uh, constant time slice of space time, and, and in principle suggests a sort of a, a constructive approach towards uh, uh, calculating this, uh, this edge term. Okay, so, so to summarize um, quickly again, right, this, this, so here's the picture we have so far. Um, in an emergent gauge theory, we can compute the entanglement entropy from the IR point of view by introducing this extended Hilbert space as like a sort of IR effective version of our UV degrees of freedom. Um, and the more speculative observation is that it looks kind of like our T formula. Um, now, of course, the, now the question is, um, can we actually test this idea in gravity? Um, so. So I think, I think for those of you guys who have heard me give this talk before, um, this is around where I left off last year. Um, it's, it's, I, th there was this analogy, it seems suggestive, and at least um, in, in a gauge theory, the edge term is a totally uh, well-defined thing that we can compute in any state of the gauge theory. Um, but the problem is that for, for gravity, um, right, there are many reasons that things are more murky, your reps are infinite dimensional, it's not clear what it means to cut a gravitational Wilson line with a with with charges and so on. Um, so so I spent a while thinking about what has to happen if we want to test this idea. 
Um, I think we need two basic ingredients. Um, so sort of a conceptual one and a technical one. Um, so conceptually, the logic is that we want this theory of gravity to emerge from some more UV degrees of freedom so that, so that we then introduce these um, extended Hilbert space as like effective versions of the stuff that, um, that gapped out along the RG. Um, so for instance, um, um, someone pointed out to me that it's not clear that we would want to extend the Hilbert space of like the full ADS supergravity since this theory is not emergent from but is exactly dual to your CFT at the level, level of the partition function. Um, so that's a conceptual point. Then as, as, as a technical point, um, if we want to explicitly construct an extended Hilbert space, we need to be able to quantize an IR theory of gravity. Right? So, um, so this is a tall order and it limits us to a very small number of theories that we need to, um, to sort of look at. Um, okay, so, so recently I realized that two situations where these things are true, um, which are secretly the same situation related by dimensional reduction, are uh, 3D pure quantum gravity and 2D JT gravity. Um, so these, these are theories of gravity that, um, that in fact have gauge theory formulations so we can quantize um, and also are believed to, to be emergent. Um, since uh, lower dimensions is always easier to work with, um, let me uh, briefly explain the story for the 2D theory. Okay, okay um, yeah, so this is, this, is, this is one very quick slide about how, uh, how JT gravity emerges from SYK. Um, depending on whether you've been following the story, um, this slide will probably either be fast or trivial. Um, I'm, so I'm on the side of people who has not been following the story until like a couple months ago. So, um, so, so I'm not an expert. Um, but the point is just to, to, to explain how this fits into our framework. Um, so, so SYK is this uh, quantum mechanics theory of n Majorana fermions with a random four Fermi, Fermi interaction. Um, and the, the relevant point for our purposes is that um, there's, a, there's a certain limit where the um, IR dynamics are described by a different um, quantum mechanics theory, which is this 1D Schwarzschild quantum mechanics. Um, so that's one fact. Another fact is that uh, suppose we just want to look at the simplest possible theory of gravity. Um, so the simplest non-trivial theory of gravity is uh, this 2D JT gravity whose action I wrote here. Um, this is, the, this, is, this is the simplest theory of gravity because if you have just 2D pure gravity, then the action is, um, reduces to the um, Euler coefficient, which is boring. So we put in a dilaton to introduce some non-trivial dynamics. Um, and, and the important fact for us is that you can, show, you, you can integrate out the bulk stuff um, and show that it's exactly equivalent to, um, to this same um, 1D Schwarzschild theory that describes the low energy dynamics of SYK. Um, so based on this observation, um, these people have said that, um, that the, the 2D JT gravity is like, a, is, is like some IR limit of whatever the, the um, bulk deal to the SYK theory is, which we don't currently know, and SYK UV completes it. Um, so it's, it's emergent in, in sort of the sense that I wrote on the previous slide. So this is one setting where we can try to compute the edge term. Okay, um, as, I, as I also mentioned, this, um, this theory conveniently has a gauge theory formulation. Um, so this, the gauge theory formulation is not a holographic deal. It's, a, it's, a, it's like an exactly equivalent change of variable. Um, basically, you can, take, you can take the JT gravity and make a vector field out of your first order variables, um, and then also make an adjoint scale around as some function of your dilaton. Um, and that just um, turns the previous action into this action here. Um, I, I didn't write the exact change of variable, but for those of you familiar with uh, 3D quantum gravity and its equivalence to uh, SL2R times SL2R Trin Simons theory, um, this is the exact same story. It's actually a, a dimensional reduction of that story where the scalar field here is, um, is a component of the gauge field in the reduced direction. Um, since, since this is a 2D gauge theory, um, this operation of extending the Hilbert space, um, trying to compute the edge term and find some, and then look for some IR operator whose VAV reproduces it is, um, is now well defined. Um, right, this theory is actually a limit of 2D Yang Mills. The only, uh, the only non-trivial ingredient is that, um, compared to the example from before, is that the gauge group in this case is non-compact, it's an SL2R. Um, so, so this fact might worry you for a number of reasons. Um, but we can go ahead and see what happens. 
Um, okay, so so for the next two slides, I'm just I'm, I'll very quickly um, summarize sort of a calculation in progress. Um, so this this isn't quite ready for public consumption, and it might be a bit too detailed. It's also not done. Um, I'm just happy to be computing something after like a year of trying to figure out what to compute. Um, so I hope you can indulge me briefly. Um, okay, so 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 far I looked at the, this theory on S1. Um, the physically relevant case, as I said earlier, is really um, when we have this theory on a spatial interval, right? If you want to do holography, you need to have boundaries. Um, but this edge term doesn't care so much about boundary conditions, and the theory on S1 um, lets us transfer over the, the results from the yang mills calculation more easily, so we'll look at it as a warm-up to, to get a sense of if, um, if having a non-compact gauge group makes any sense. Um, eventually, we should do everything on the interval, and then we'll just pick out a different set of states in the physical Hilbert space. Um, Okay, so 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 let me tell you what this theory looks what what theory looks like on S one. Um, so if you if you take this Lagrangian description and rewrite it in a one plus one decomposition, um, you see that there's one canonically conjugate pair of variables um, plus the um, plus the uh, the other component of the gauge field imposes a Gauss law. Um, the the Gauss constraint on the wave functions is actually the same one that appears for the two D Yang mills. Um, so the Hilbert space of the BF theory on S1 is still going to be the space of class functions on your group manifold, and the extended Hilbert space will again be the space of the uh, square integrable functions, um, or two copies of it. Um, each of these spaces is spanned by now a subset of the characters and matrix elements for the unitary reps of SL2R. Um, in this case, we only want to keep a subset because some of these reps lead to non-normalizable wave functions. Okay. Um, so, so those are that, that's the Hilbert space and the extended Hilbert space. Now I have to tell you how you embed one in the other. Um, so, so there's one technicality that comes up, which is that your characters um, are not now defined as traces over matrix elements, um, um, right? Because your reps are infinite dimensional. So if you if you summed infinitely many matrix elements, it would diverge on the identity. Um, so this this the easiest path to computing the edge term in the compact case by doubling the definition of the character um, doesn't work. Um, these uh, mathematicians tell us that one can define characters for the rest of SL2R, but from some more sophisticated uh, technology. Um, so rather than go through this direct embedding, another way to read off, um, to read off this, um, this edge term is to use this fact that I briefly mentioned earlier that the extended Hilbert space formula by construction agrees with the naive replica trick from um, gluing. This lets us work at the space of class functions um, instead of the matrix elements. Um, so, so sort of if you, if, you, if you go through this calculation and, and I did things correctly, then the upshot is that this, uh, the dim R term in the compact formula seems to be replaced by something called the formal dimension. Um, for the reps of SL2R that, that, that you get when you decompose the um, identity in the Fourier inversion formula. Um, um, to summarize this slide, the, the, the point is that the, the reps being infinite dimensional doesn't seem prohibitive for us to get a finite answer from this construction, um, which you might have suspected as soon as you learned that, that mathematicians were able to define characters for these representations. Um, okay, so, so now there's, that's, there's a bunch of things I have to do next that I haven't done, um, but hopefully I'll be able to report on them the next time I give this talk. Um, so, so what has to happen next? Um, basically, we, um, instead of working in the gauge theory variables, we have to translate back to the gravity variables. Um, so there's sort of a table to fill out here. Um, all right, on the one hand, we want to understand what this edge term looks like um, sort of as an operator from a purely IR point of view. Um, so in the in the gauge theory, we should be able to quickly find some operator that reproduces um, that reproduces this edge term as the VEBS, and then and then we want to map it to gravity variables, and like and see whether there's some interesting interpretation, um, right? Maybe having to do with some two-dimensional version of the area operator. Um, on the other hand, this dimension in the BF theory is the thing with the um, that has a counting interpretation as like some specific measure of pure gauge degrees of freedom. Um, so we also under, want to un understand what it means in the gravity variables, um, right? So, so, so these things remain to be done, but at least they seem like fairly concrete tasks, as opposed to the state of this project that you guys maybe heard about the last time I gave this talk. Um, so I hope to report on them soon. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, so there's this identification between the RT area term and this um, and this entanglement edge term um, in gravity. 
This follows from um, fairly minimal assumptions in ADS-CFT, um, and it also seems closely related to independent conjectures that many people made in the past 20 years. Um, and again, the, the advantage of this ADS-CFT analogy is that you get to um, you, you, is that you, you get to sort of try to count these degrees of freedom without worrying about um, like a on a, on a constant time slice without worrying about a horizon. Um, it would be very exciting to prove this explicitly and understand exactly what it is that the um, black hole entropy is counting. Um, and this uh, 2D gravity is sort of the one the one setting I've thought of so far where perhaps we can say something more precise. Um, of maybe there are other settings that I haven't thought of, and if anyone has ideas, it would, um, I would love to discuss after the talk. So uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. This, this term that you are, this log DR, mm -hmm. is um, it's, it's local. It's something local on the on the shape of the boundary. Um, yeah, I guess it sort of depends how you interpret it. It's like it's like it's kind of, it's kind of counting the dimensions of all your Wilson lines that or Wilson loops that cross the boundary. So it's. Uh, what I mean is, suppose you you cut the 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 bulk many times, you yeah. get infinitely many entropy. Yeah, yeah. So this is not uh, something I think. Uh, what I mean is that perhaps this term has a meaning when you compute it on the on the Ryuta Kanai surface. Mm -hmm. But then it's not just this term is is for this special surface. And and it, then it has another meaning. Um sorry, I'm not sure I understood. I, I, uh, what yeah. I mean is that uh, these boundary terms, uh -huh. if you if you draw any line, it will give you an entropy as as far as much as you want, uh, so and they are not counting any degrees of freedom on the on the <coughs> on the on the on the boundary of ADS. Well, they. I mean, the, de depending what surface you draw, you draw, you get a specific answer. Right? Uh, um, well, uh, yeah, I guess maybe I'm, I'm still not sure what what the question is. Um, what I mean is that uh, if you cut many times the bulk. If you, oh, you, you, oh, are, uh -huh. you are getting like uh, entropies of the bulk that are not in the in the quantum field theory. Uh, so you mean if you draw like just a surface in a subregion in, in a region in the bulk? I'm not taking a Rutherfordian surface, any surface. Yeah. So you're, okay, you're asking uh, you're asking whether what, what I can define this term for any surface. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, you can. You can, you can. But I'm not I'm not tr claiming that there's some interpretation like aside from this analogy with the boundary. More questions? We're having lunch. Okay, well, let's thank Jennifer again for the talk. Thank you. But it's something that comes from, what I mean is there is a conservation law of it. There is something that we can say that uh, if I move the surface, I get the same, or something like that. Or there is something no. non-local, it's just pure. No, it's meaning.